Welcome everybody. We're just gonna wait a minute for everybody to log on. All right. So um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Merit Sukovich, the sponsor of the Healy um, trial. I'm here with um, uh, uh, Dr. Lada from uh, BNI and Dr. Paganoni and Alison Bullock. Uh, but we also have our special guest today from CELOS, um, Dr. Warren, and I should be able to pronounce this, but I'm not sure I'll get it right. W Wojcicki? Wojcicki, that's right. Wojcicki. And uh, Luke Politsky. And yes, it is everybody from Poland today um, to, to tell um, tell uh, you about um, see, uh, the drug uh, regimen E and about the science and why we're excited for this uh, to be um, part of the platform trial and to answer your questions. Um, so we are going we are recording this and we'll have it on our website um, for uh, anyone uh, who wants to listen to it again or for anyone you want to share it with. With that, I'll, I'll pass the Zoom to uh, Warren, please. Well, thanks, Merrick. Um, first of all, I thank everyone for joining us this afternoon, and uh, I want to say how excited we are to be part of the uh, uh, platform trial being run by Merrick and her uh, exquisite team. Uh, and so glad to be working with you guys uh, toward a, a significant goal here in treating these patients. So uh, my name is Warren Wachewski. I am the Senior Consulting Neurologist for CELOS Therapeutics. And I'm joined today by Luke, Luke Filipski, who is our uh, senior uh, um, operation uh, director. Um, and we're going to go through some slides about the what Trelos is and how why we believe it may be effective in the treatment of uh, ALS. So the, the first slide is a forward, what we call our forward-looking statements. This is because our company is publicly traded. And if you're going to, if you purchase stock or anything like that, you will see these statements. And this is something that we have to make sure that everyone's aware of. And if anyone would like a copy of that, then you need to go on to our website or we can send it to you. Uh, it's just a disclaimer as to that the drug has not been approved yet. So let's talk about Trelos. So Trelos is the investigational drug that's being used for regimen E. And it is an IV formulation. IV trailos has not been approved for treatment in any disease in any country and no regulatory agency to date has determined that it's safe and effective. That's the nature of investigational drugs. Taking, I, taking trailos by mouth, however, is not equivalent to receiving an infusion of IV trailos. And you'll see why in a little bit, but basically it's broken down in the gut so it does not get absorbed. So IV trailos is not the same kind of trailos that you can buy on uh, the websites uh, to take orally. And to date, there may be some side effects or other safety concerns of IV trailos that we have not seen yet uh, that are unexpected or unanticipated. So just a little disclaimer that it's an investigational drug that we, we know quite a bit about, but we don't know everything yet. So what is trailos? So trailos is a disaccharide. A disaccharide is two sugars linked together. And this particular disaccharide is two glucose molecules linked together. It is found extensively in nature. It's found in, in vegetables and fruits and a number of other uh, food substances. And humans do not make trailos, uh, but we can metabolize them. So it is part of, it can be taken as a uh, food supplement and people do do that. But oral trailos is not absorbed into the into this systemic circulation because it is broken down by what are called trailases or enzymes in the gut that break it down into two glucose molecules. So if you were to take in 100 grams of trailose, only 0.5% of that would actually get into your bloodstream as trailose. Most of it would go in as glucose. Trailases are the enzymes, again, that break down trailose. They're found in the gut. So your stomach and your intestines, they're found in the kidney, they're found in the liver, and they break down trailose into two glucose molecules. In this study, we're using IV trailose. The objective here is to bypass the gut trailase enzymes 
so that we don't break down, that doesn't break down the trailos, but we actually get trailos into the bloodstream. And we do know that trailos penetrates both the muscle and brain intact, uh, the two organs of interest here, of course, uh, for ALS and other diseases as well. And for the, anybody who's a chemist on the right-hand side, you can see the structure of the drug, which is two glucose molecules linked together. Uh, and it has some very unique properties because of the way they're linked together. So let's talk about what, why trailose may be effective for ALS. So we'll talk about what's called the mechanism of action. So trailose has been known for a long period of time to stabilize proteins. And as you can see in the right-hand panel, we have some proteins that are produced that are mutant proteins that can aggregate to form abnormal uh, toxic aggregates of material. And trailose, which is the little blue stuff on this particular slide, can prevent that from occurring. And that can be important for certain other diseases, as well as it may have contributed somewhat to the, to the way that trailose works for ALS. The second thing that trailose does is it, oh, there we go. It activates a system called autophagy. And what autophagy is, is a way to break down abnormal proteins or, or break down normal proteins in the cell when the cell is in a starvation scenario. But this, what happens in terms of ALS is it helps break down those proteins that are aggregated abnormally, such as the SOG1, SOG1 or TPD43. So we have the trailose here binding to a glucose transporter. So it allows it, to, it prevents the, it actually can get into the cell, but it also can cause the cell to block the transporter and shift the cell into a starvation scenario. So that begins to break down things within the cell in an attempt for the cell to survive. But probably most importantly, it also activates the genes that continue this process. So on the right-hand side, you see the you know, trailos getting into the cell, binding to this very important protein called TFEB, which goes into the nucleus and then creates more, uh, what we call lysosomal proteins, that help break down these abnormal accumulations of things like TPD43 and uh, SOG1 mutate, SOG1. So just to help uh, understand a little bit further, what is autophagy? So autophagy means, is from the Greek, it means self-devouring. And what it means is that it's the cellular process in which uh, the cell will begin to break down uh, things within the cell itself to prevent a cell from starving. So when a cell needs energy and none is available, the starvation scenario kicks in, breaks down cellular components to create the energy that it needs. So that's one mechanism, that's one activity for autophagy. So autophagy, as I mentioned just briefly before, is a survival mechanism. So the cells can survive in a, a hostile environment of no, no nutritional nutrition being uh, supplied to them. But why is it important in ALS? Well, it's also the natural process that removes unnecessary and abnormal proteins. And we know that autophagy is impaired in ALS and it leads to the aggregation of cellular material, material such as the SOG1 and TPD, TPD43 that inhibit cellular function and actually can cause uh, cell death. So several, several animal models that have, have shown that the treatment with trailos activates autophagy and clears these toxic materials that cause injury to the CNS. So that's why we think that the autophagy pathways are very important for ALS. It helps get rid of the toxic uh, accumulation of material within the cell, which can lead to cellular death. So what have we seen in animal models of trailos? I'm going to give you a list of things and I'll show you some studies as well. So treatment of trailos in the mouse model of ALS and in cell lines have demonstrated a number of things. Let me just make a quick comment about the mouse model. Mice do not have trailase enzymes in their stomach or their gut. So they can be given trailos orally, whereas we, don't, we can't administer trailos orally to patients because Again, it breaks, it's, it gets broken down. But you can do this in the animal models. So what have we seen? Well, what we've seen across a number of different 
studies in a number of different laboratories in different models as well, whether it's an ALS or Huntington's disease or other diseases, that treatment with trelos activates the autophagy pathways that I just mentioned. It delays the onset of the disease in animal models of ALS. It prolongs survival in those animals. It reduces the aggregation of these toxic aggregates of, of SOG1 mutation, of SOG1 proteins, as well as other mutation, or excuse me, other aggregates of protein. It reduces the motor neuron loss. Of course, motor neurons are the neurons that are responsible for a function of the muscles. It improves motor function, so the animals actually can maintain motor function after being treated, uh, despite having the disease process. And finally, it preserves weight, which is a marker of good health in these, in these animal models. So let me show you a few examples of these models and what they've done. So this is, this is a cellular model of, of ALS. It's a, these are motor neurons in tissue culture over here on the right side. And <clears throat> what we're seeing on the right, if you look over to the right panel, it's the best place to look. This green material out here is that special protein I was talking about, transcription factor, EB, that as you see, as it is exposed to trailos, as the culture is exposed to trailos from zero to 48 hours, that the green material is moving into the nucleus, the blue material. So the nucleus is blue, the TFE is, TFEB is green, and it moves into the nucleus where it activates autophagy. So that's, that's a big, that's an important step. And in that case, it also cleared, in, these, in, this, in this study, it clears the uh, accumulation of TPD43. So that's a cellular model of ALS. This is the mouse model for ALS, and this is in a, what's called a SOG1 mouse. And again, we're talking about the treatment of mice with oral trailose over a period of time. And when you treat these mice, you see that there's a delayed onset of the disease. So if you look at panel C down here, you'll see that this, this is what we call a Kaplan-Meier curve. And as the mice become infect or become demonstrating the, their symptoms, you can see that the number of mice that still don't have it goes down. And the dotted line here shows the mice who were treated with uh, trailose compared to mice who weren't treated with trailose. And you can see the disease onset is delayed. It also prolongs survival in a similar type curve. Here's another curve where the animal, the death of the animals, you can see that the, the number of animals dying increases over time. Here, the, the, the life expectancy for the mice that were not treated uh, or is about 125 days, and those who were treated is over 150, 145, roughly 145 days. So a significant, a significant um, prolongation of survival. And there's preserved muscle strength. So in the top panel where we see the mice being suspended by their tail, the mouse all the way on the left here is what's called a wild type mouse. He does not have uh, the side mutation. And you can see that he's uh, flailing about quite substantially. The mouse in, the, uh, in this panel was treated with, was not treated at all. And you can see that his rear legs are just hanging a bit loosely. And then in the next panel, this is an animal treated with sucrose. And sucrose is like trelos because it's two sugars linked together, but it has no effect, doesn't have the effects that, that trelos has. And then in the right-hand panel, you can see the mouse again. Now this mouse has more control of his rear legs and can extend his legs out. So it's preserving the motor function in the, in the posterior extremities. And then it also preserves weight. So here we see the wild type animal, the normal animal where he's gaining weight here. And here we see the two out, the animals who were treated with sucrose or no treatment at all are losing weight rapidly here. And the ones treated with trailos are sustaining their weight. Eventually, of course, they, they begin to lose weight as well. We don't cure the disease, but we can alter the, hopefully alter the course of the disease. In this study also, there was some histology that looked at motor neuron loss, how many neurons were lost, and how the, uh, the spinal cord was, or excuse me, the muscles 
were innovated with the muscle, with, uh, in, in terms of how the neuron interacts with the muscles. And that showed that there was a reduction in the motor neuron loss and skeletal, what's called denervation, which is when we lose contact with the muscle, was reduced as well. They also looked at autophagy. So again, just like the other models, it increased, it improved autophagy and it reduced the aggregation of the SOG1, SOG1 proteins as well as another protein, SQSM1 slash P62 or just P62. Um, and so again, these are two toxic, two toxic accumulations that occur in these animal models that lead to cellular death. This is another study, again, from a different laboratory this time, using a similar model for, of SOD1 mutation uh, for the, for the, in the mouse. And again, when we looked at the, when they look at the production of SOD1 and P62, it's in the spinal cord, it is decreased. We see an increase in what's called uh, LC3, which is a marker of autophagy. So if, if when we see activation of autophagy through the use of this, this gene that we talked about earlier and its transcription factors, um, you get an increased production of this protein, which is important for uh, the process to take place. We see a a, the disease onset is postponed in panel A, uh, which is being blocked a little bit for me. But in panel A, you can see the, the red line is the animals who were not treated. And you can see that the onset of the disease uh, and, uh, is within 105 days. Essentially, all the animals, or 101 days, have, all the animals are affected. And then as you look out at the blue line, that's where the uh, animals treated with trailers, and they have onset of disease uh, delayed by about eight days, which in, amount, in, in the lifespan of the mouse is substantial. They also have delayed progression of disease in, in panel B. Again, what we're seeing here is the animals accumulating deficits over time. And you can see that the animals, the, the control animals in red are accumulating more deficits or more muscle uh, dysfunction over time compared to the lines in blue where we see less uh, uh, decline of function and actually last longer until they reach a certain level. So we're preserving motor function here uh, not completely, but uh, again, delaying the progression of the disease. It also prolongs survival. So you can see that on the bottom and C, you can see that the red line, again, are the animals who are not treated, live about 148 days compared to the animals who are treated who live well over 150 days after about 160 days. So we have similar findings across a number of different labs demonstrating that the drug uh, can be potentially efficacious for the treatment of ALS. And then the animals' brains were looked at uh, for other changes that occur in ALS, such as inflammation within, uh, within the brain, et cetera, and spinal cord. And we can see that this was reduced. This is called microgliosis gliosis or astrogliosis. And we also, in, uh, model in, in looking at motor function in these mice, it preserved their motor function. Uh, for certain types of tests, such as called rotor rod and other tests that are done to look at motor function in these animal models. So we have three, this is from three different labs showing, uh, showing the same essential effect, essentially the same effects in two models uh, in vivo and in tissue culture demonstrating the same changes. And there are other studies which have from other labs that have demonstrated these same changes. Um, it, and it's fairly, uh, robust uh, effects. So, summary, trellose is the naturally occurring sugar, again, composed of two glucose molecules. It has some very unique properties. It's the investigational drug we're using. The lab data here suggests that trellose has the potential to treat ALS. Not only does it treat ALS with respect to the phenotype, the way it's expressed in terms of how the animals look and how they function, but also alters what's occurring at the genomic level in terms of activation of genes. We're really uh, excited to be participating in the Healy Platform trial and uh, to find out if, in fact, trellos is safe and effective for pe people with living with ALS. And we hope to uh, uh, find, get that answer fairly quickly. And I thank you all for your attention and I'm open to any questions at, at this time. 
thank you very much, Warren. Uh, we do have a lot of questions coming for you. We thought right before you uh, answer these uh, questions, uh, we wanted Carol from uh, PCM maybe just to turn on our video and say hello and tell you just a little bit about their service. And I'll, I'll just preface that by saying that um, uh, we want to make this trial as um, uh, uh, friendly and uh, patient centric as possible, and um, that we uh, with with CELOS have um, asked PCM to help us uh, give the IV infusions after the first four weeks in the home, uh, so that um, it's easier for people who are participating. So uh, they're an amazing company that can do this for research drugs. So Carol, uh, welcome. Okay, thank you. So my name is Carol Hanish. I'm a senior clinical project manager at PCM Trials. So just a little bit about PCM Trials. Uh, we are headquartered in Denver, Colorado. We've been providing uh, services since 2008, over 37,000 mobile research visits completed. We're involved in over 400 trials. Um, and something unique about PCM Trials is uh, we hire certified mobile research nurses. So we make sure they are registered, they are screened and hired directly by us. They are certified in good clinical practices, and they are trained and managed directly by a PCM Trials project manager. And we are always available to your site for consultation and collaboration. Thank you, Carol. Um, Carol's here for questions as well. But we wanted to, uh, we're very excited to work with you. And I think this is the way of the future for uh, um, in doing as much as we can in people's homes. So with that, I'll turn it to Sabrina. Yes, and, and as always, we have um, lots of questions that are coming in. So please keep typing them and, and we'll take them and we'll ask our panelists to answer. So the que first question for you, Warren, why do you think it's trialose that works and not sucrose? And the question states, both are disaccharides. So that's a good question. And, and the, the reason we, that um, it appears that trailos is more, has these unique proper, properties is because the way the two glucose molecules are linked together. Uh, it's called an alpha one, alpha one bond that does not occur in, in typical disaccharides. And so sucrose is another disaccharide that was used as comparator, of course. And, um, but it doesn't have the same effects, most likely because of this unique bond. Because of this unique bond, trellose also interacts with proteins in a very different way than other disaccharide molecules do. So that's probably why it has these effects and why it causes the starvation scenario and why it has active ability to activate um, autophagy. So it's a unique molecule in that respect. Great, thank you. And um, another question for you about the metabolism of your compound trialose. Um, it was mentioned that there are enzymes called trialases in the liver as well as in the gut. And the question is, with chronic administration of trialose, wouldn't the liver trialase limit brain uptake? And a second question related to that, would, would the enzymes be upregulated with repeated IV administration? So not... So most of trailose is actually metabolized at, at the, in the kidney. There are more trailase enzymes in the kidney that break down the trailase into two, two glucose molecules. And, and, then it's, and then the glucose is excreted in the urine. We have treated patients with, other, with another disease for almost two years, and we saw no changes in the way they metabolize trailose over that, that period of time. Trailose has a very short half-life in the blood. It doesn't last more than, a, than about an hour and a half. But, what, but the effect of the drug is how it, when it gets into the cell and what it does within the cell. So upregulation of enzymes is probably not going to happen. If you, if you do that in the gut, you do get upregulation of enzymes. If you take large quantities of trailose, you'll get upregulation of the enzymes. But that we have not seen that. Uh, and it's probably because the clearance is predominantly renal. Great. Yep. Yeah, there's a couple of questions that uh, popped up when you were explaining the mouse model results. And so I'll, I'll, I'll ask you both and maybe I'll ask others to comment as well. Um, so uh, the, the first question is, how come that the, the drug doesn't stop the disease in the mouse model? And sort of along those lines, um, a question about, you know, do we know how the increased length of survival in the mouse models 
might translate to humans. Do you want to start, Warren? And maybe I'll ask Dr. Sukovic as well to comment on, on these models. Sure. I, in terms of why doesn't it stop the disease uh, in the models is in many cases, with the way these models are uh, done, it takes, a, it takes several weeks for the animals to begin to express symptoms. And so we're almost already behind the eight ball in terms of getting to be able to sort of quote, stop the disease. Obviously, the earlier you could treat the better, but this is not reversing the primary pathology of the disease. It's helping reduce the toxicity of the materials that are being accumulated uh, and hopefully preserving neurons, uh, but it's not gonna stop the, it doesn't seem to appear to stop the progression. Now we don't know for sure that that won't happen, but we don't believe that that's gonna happen. So I'll, Shafu and Merritt, I, I'll ask you to comment as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> Um, I can say something, and then uh, I want to say that Dr. Lada is the, um, we're, we're uh, co-leads of this regimen E, and um, I'd like, love to hear his answer on this too. I'll say that the mouse model, the one, one of them that you talked about, the SOD1, in order to get a, what we call a phenotype, meaning the show the motor neuron symptoms in the mouse model, you have to put eight copies of the mutant uh, SOD1 gene in that mouse. And so, for example, people who carry SOD1 only have one copy. So it's, they make a very aggressive mouse model so that you can test your drugs in five months and not in like many, many years. So it's not an exact uh, you know, replication of what happens in people. But I think it's a really good model to test that your drug is working on the target you think it, it's important to, which which Celos has shown. But it's not a good model for saying if you do you know, X number of weeks uh, longer survival in the mouse model that what that translates to the people uh, that that I don't think it's a useful uh, model for um, Dr. Lada. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I, and I think it's important to remember what a complex disease ALS is, right? The, the mouse model of ALS is not what humans experience with ALS. And there's multiple mechanisms with, with the disease. And so protein aggregation and protein misfolding is one part of the disease. And if that was the only part, then maybe, yes, a drug like this could sort of, quote, stop the disease. But, but the problem is that there's interplay between different mechanisms. And so we hear a lot about neuroinflammation as a potential um, uh, contributor to, to motor neuron loss. And if you think of how the two re could relate, you know, for instance, if a motor neuron dies and spills out a bunch of proteins into the blood or into the local environment, that triggers the immune response the immune response now has sort of a life of its own, which continues to damage motor neurons. So this is, and, and this probably happens in the mouse model too. So this is probably a good reason why we wouldn't expect that targeting a single mechanism would completely stop the disease. Yeah, there's many, many more interesting questions that are coming in. So I was thinking just to break up, uh, change a little bit, uh, go to clinical topics, and then maybe we go back to the animal models. I wanted to ask Dr. Lada, few clinical questions at, uh, about this regimen that we are, we are starting now. Are Riluzol and Radicava allowed to be used while on this regimen? Yes, they are. So the, the, the Riluzol and Radicava um, requirements are the same as for the master protocol. So it doesn't really differ in this regimen from any of the other regimens. And basically what we require is that you're, you're either on them and at a stable dose or not on them when you're at the screening visit. Great. And a few more questions for you about the trial itself um, in people with ALS. So how often is the infusion done? Does one need to have a port? And who is the ideal candidate for this trial? Well, so um, the, the first part of that question is about the infusions. The infusions are done um, weekly. Um, and for the first four weeks, you'll do them at your clinical site. Uh, where you enroll in the study. And then after that, you have the option if the, your investigator um, agrees to have them done at home. Um, you don't have to have a port, they can be done IV. If you do have a port, the infusions can be done through the port. Um, we ask that um, Adaravone or Radicava isn't done at the same time or within an hour of the, of the infusion. Um, and then now I'm forgetting the, oh, who's the ideal candidate? Um, well, I mean, I, I think the ideal candidate is the same for the master protocol. I mean, we only have a few exclusions um, in this regimen that we don't have in the master protocol. So really, obviously, the master protocol in most research studies are looking for people who are 
earlier in the in the disease um, course, um, and we want to balance that with having a representative sample size. We want a group of patients that, rep that roughly represents what we see in the real world. Um, hopefully that answers that. I'll add just one comment, which is that we know this protein aggregation happens in 98% uh, uh, of people with, uh, actually 100% um, of people with ALS. So I think this is relevant for every, every uh, type of ALS. Great, thank you. Um, a question for our colleagues from PCM, um, again, thinking about the logistics uh, and the patient experience in this regimen. Will PCM offer blood draws or other nursing services in the trial in addition to the infusions? So PCM is uh, absolutely capable of offering blood draws. We do have to work within the scope of work that's been outlined and agreed upon in our budget. Um, so we would have to double check and make sure that that gets added into the budget before approaching that. I'll just say that most of the during most of the weekly infusions, there's no need for blood draws. Um, and then we do ask people to come back for um, um, every eight weeks approximately so that we can um, do some of the study assessments to see how the drug's working. So uh, the blood draws are timed for those visits so that it can be convenient. For people who are interested in enrolling, are there any exclusionary drugs or supplements for this regimen? Maybe I don't know if Dr. Lada, if you want to start. Yeah, the only excluded drug is oral trehalose. Um, everything else um, is really done by the master protocol, which um, which doesn't really exclude anything. We do the 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 added exclusion is that we can't enroll people with diabetes because of the the potential risk, even though we think it's fairly low, but the potential risk of the added sugar that that trehalose uh, provides. Great question for Warren. Um, would oral administration be efficacious? Would it be what, efficacious? Yeah, efficacious, yeah. Yeah, so the, the difficulty with getting taking oral is to take enough oral drug to actually activate these processes that we talked about, about would cause a significant diarrhea. So if you take more than 50 grams of trelos, um, you're going to have a, a significant diarrhea and malabsorption. So it's very, very, uh, because of that 50 grams, only one half of 1% is actually going to be absorbed as trailos. And so you end up getting this uh, huge glucose load and causing a problem. So it's, so it's very difficult to achieve that. That's why, again, we, we went to the IV formulation of the drug. Great, thank you. There's a few questions about the mechanism of action of the drug. So I'll start with one. Would trialos affect oxidative stress? We don't have any data right now to show that, um, but there are there there are some in other models. There's been some uh, uh, comments around mitochondrial activity, but again, we don't have that in ALS. And on this topic, uh, what's your perspective on the relative importance of the direct effect of your molecule on protein aggregation? as opposed to enhancement of autophagy? What would be most important? I believe, well, from my perspective, I believe that in this particular disorder, the activation of autophagy is probably more important than the protein stabilization. In other disorders where we have mutant proteins that are able to be altered slightly and maintain function, uh, that may be more, more important there. But in this case, I think the autophagy and the clearance of the toxic metabolites or toxic protein aggregates is probably more important uh, now, trailos may help prevent some of the formation of the toxic uh, 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 materials because it's called the chaperone protein. As you can see, I showed on the slide, it binds to proteins and tries to prevent them from aggregating together. Uh, but again, I think the activation of autophagy and through both the starvation scenario as well as the activation of the genes is probably the most important part for the treatment of this particular disorder. There's a couple of questions about your previous experience in humans with this drug. So one question is, is there any human experience with the drug? And the other question is, are there any phase two data? So there are, there has been experience with this drug in two other indications, uh, actually three now. Uh, in uh, one study of a, another muscle disease that patients were treated for almost two full years, the safety profile looks pretty 
decent um, and the, uh, the drug appears to be well tolerated. That was one indication. A second indication was a, a disease uh, of ataxia uh, where patients were treated for approximately a year. Uh, and again, the drug appeared to be well tolerated. And then uh, we are now treating a couple of patients uh, with, uh, with, the, with the drug uh, who have rare uh, diseases and so far it's been uh, well tolerated. So we do have experience in approximately 30 patients who were treated for almost two full years uh, with no serious uh, consequences. However, again, as I mentioned earlier, we may not know all the potential adverse events that can occur with this drug as of today. Yeah, I have a question, a few questions for Dr. Sukovic about one topic of exclusionary drugs. Uh, would TATCA sodium phenylbutyrate be exclusionary? Um, yes, right now, um, any drug that's uh, uh, considered experimental in ALS is exclusionary in the platform trial as well as all other ALS clinical trials. Um, but drugs that are on the market for ALS, like the Rilazole and the Daravone or Nudexta, or anything for symptoms are, are allowed. Um, and, and that obviously becomes revisited as, as the field changes and new drugs come on the market. But right now, uh, Tutka and Bufamol are considered, and the Amlex combination are considered experimental. So does it, so do a follow-up question to that. What if AMX35 and or oral, oral radicava were to be approved by the FDA? Would that assessment change? Yeah, that's a really good question. I know we talked about it, I think, at, at last week a little bit. So we haven't made a, a final decision about that. I think um, there's, and we've been talking to um, our patient advisory committee, as well as um, um, other experts. So this, I think oral adaravone is kind of easier. If someone's on IV uh, adaravone and they want to switch to oral, um, I, I think if they approve it, they're the FDA is telling us they're equivalent, that would be fine. I think if in the middle of a trial, um, people start to take uh, a new drug, it might make it very hard to tell if this, if this, if the Celos drug is positive or not. And of course, nobody wants us not to be able to tell if the drug works or not. So we're, we're going to um, kind of keep looking at this and the timing and see um, what the decision, uh, what, what, what's the best thing to do for the entire field. The oral uh, the open label part of this study, so that's after six months of the double blind period, uh, we would um, let uh, people take anything that's on the market. But we'll come back to this committee with the final decision. We're really kind of working it out with statisticians in, um, in April, and um, I hope to have a decision on this in May. Great. There's several questions about the formulation of the drug. So I'll start asking them maybe rapid fire to, to Warren. Um, for example, uh, can we formulate trialos in nano carriers to allow administration by mouth? Uh, well, I could just say, tell you that we're looking at other potential formulations right now. But the, the issue here with respect to trialos administration is that the, the amount of drug that we have to administer to in to induce the effects is fairly high. And so instead of getting milligram quantities, we're giving gram quantities. And so it would, it, so get other formulations may be a little difficult to, uh, to get, but, but I can tell you that the company is working on different ways of delivering the drug, so. Is, is TATCA considered an oral form of trialos? Is what? TATCA, is that considered an oral form of trialos? No. No, right. Uh, if the half-life is so short, why wouldn't a daily dose be more effective? So the half-life is, is short, but the pharma, what's called the pharmacodynamic effect lasts for a long period, longer period of time. So we're not really worried about how long Trelo stays in the blood because we know it gets cleared fairly quickly, but we do know that when we get it into muscle and to brain, Trelos, as Trelos, remains there for anywhere from 24 to 48 hours. And so the effects that, occur, that are occurring within, this, within the muscle and within the brain are the effect of what's happened in the cell, not what's in the blood. Great. And actually, to that point, there was a question, can trialos cross the uh, blood-brain barrier? Can it get into yes. the brain? Yeah, it crosses the blood-brain barrier very easily. Um, and it, as I said, it, it maintains it. It actually su survives in the brain as trialos for about anywhere from 24 to 36 hours in the brain and up to 48 hours in the uh, muscle. So. And, and would someone have to take the infusions um, for the rest of their life? 
Right now, that's we believe that that would be the case. Yeah. yeah. There's a question about your other studies you did in in humans with with different diseases. Did your drug improve their condition in other diseases? So the the two studies that were done in those two different one muscle disease and one disease of ataxia were exploratory studies looking uh, with no specific control group. You know, in this study, as you, everyone knows, there's a control group, patients who get placebo versus patients who get active drug. And we did, uh, we did the studies exploring whether the drug uh, would, could be well tolerated and was safe. And they were, do they were actually done open label by a different company, it wasn't done by CELOS, it was done by a different company. Um, and so there was no control, control group there to compare it to. Um, having said that, we did publish a little bit of data on one of the muscle diseases, which showed that the patients appeared to improve over a period of about six months. Um, and, but again, without a control group, we have to be careful how we interpret that. Dr. Sukovic, I wanted to ask a clarification question because somebody um, commented on what supplements are allowed in the open label extension and specifically somebody who is in the open label extension for regimen C wants to know if, uh, if they can take Tatka or Clembuterol. Uh, as part of the open label extension. Yeah, so if so, the, in the current platform trial, um, uh, if, if a drug is marketed uh, for ALS, so not considered experimental, people can take it. So Rilazole and, and uh, IV Adarivo and Nudexta are some examples. But Tutka and Bufalo are still considered experimental. And we, we all know there it's going under FDA review now, but because of that, it's not allowed in the open label or the double blind of regimens A through D. My, my point before was that if by the time we're at the open label extension for a regimen E and there's new drugs in the market, uh, we would do our best to be able to allow people to be on it. Um, but, but we are working very closely with CELOS and, uh, and our statisticians to figure out what we would need to do to the study to make it so that it's, it's an option, but also that we can still learn if CELOS drug works or not, which is really important. It's complicated. It's a good problem to have, but it's complicated. We haven't sorted it all out yet. Yeah. So I wanted to um, tackle a few questions about genetics. Maybe Dr. Lada, some of these are more general, not just specific to trialos. Um, is there any genetic testing in the trial for participants? There is not specific clinical genetic testing. So um, many people will elect to, to be part of the DNA sample collection, but you don't get those results back. Um, however, there's um, you know, a lot more um, availability of genetic testing now. Um, and there are free programs that your provider can put you in touch with to, to um, get genetic testing. So I would just encourage you to talk to your ALS doctor about it. And, and general question, would gene editing stop the disease? Well, I, I think we don't know, first of all, as a general answer. Um, it probably would only um, be possible to stop the disease in a uh, someone with familial ALS who has a very specific gene, that would probably be the place that we would start with gene editing. Um, but I think we still have the same problem that we talked about earlier, which is that there's multiple mechanisms going on in ALS, some of which may kind of be on autopilot after the disease starts, and changing the genes after that may not help. We don't know, I think. Going back to trialos, um... Well, and there's a few questions about again, the type of uh, drug. Uh, why not glucose instead of trialose? So the, the, I cut, sort of addressed that a little bit earlier, that the way that the trialose glucose molecules are bound together gives it its unique properties. And those unique properties are its ability to bind with, to, uh, to chaperone proteins, as I showed you earlier in the slides, and to activate autophagy. You can give large quantities of glucose and not get the same activation of autophagy or get the protection around the uh, proteins uh, to prevent uh, aggregation of proteins. It just doesn't have that. And in a sort of a very simplistic way, the way it protects proteins is it actually creates a barrier around the proteins to allow uh, preventing the water from interacting with proteins. So it's a little bit complicated chemistry as a result of this unique bond. Uh, this alpha-1, alpha-1 bond, which you don't see in other disaccharides and certainly not in glucose because it doesn't, it's not two molecules to put together. And a question about the dose. Um, there's no dose finding in this trial. How do you know that this is the right dose for ALS? 
So we've looked at other, we looked at doses in the previous studies, we looked at lower doses to see if there's what kind of effect that we may be having. And so we explored that, but then we also uh, taking advice from the regulatory, from the FDA in terms of dosing, uh, we did a study to determine what the, what's called the maximum tolerated of dose is uh, at the recommendation of the FDA. And we, as they suggested that based on the mechanisms that we're proposing that we use the dose that's the maximum tolerated dose. And so that's where we are right now with the dosing. Great. And, uh, Dr. Sukovic, the, uh, there's a request for updates in terms of enrollment numbers. Uh, can you tell us more of where we stand with the uh, regimen? Well, as everyone knows, we are finished with enrollment with A through D. Um, and um, I think we now have five or six people who are dosed and uh, about uh, 12 or 13 people who have screened that are getting ready to be dosed. I'm sorry, it's not that uh, as exact as we are every week, but we'll continue to show that every week. And we're having more and more sites that are activated and um, looking for participants. Uh, are there any autophagy biomarkers that are being measured in this regimen? Uh, Dr. Lada, do you want to take that? Yeah, I can, I can take that. I mean, Warren certainly can chime in after this. Um, you know, most of our biomarkers um, are either related to the drug mechanisms themselves or related to the outcome we're looking for, which it would be survival. And so, um, you know, certainly in this trial, we're looking at a lot of different biomarkers. Um, neurofilament is one that we've used quite a bit um, and we think is relevant to um, motor neuron survival itself. Um, I'm sure there are specific biomarkers related to autophagy. Warren, maybe you can comment on those and which ones you guys might be looking at. Yeah, so there, there is one particular aut autophagy biomarker called LC32, LC323, LC3 which we would look at, but um, we, are, we are not collecting that because for two reasons. One, it's in CS, it would be have to be collected in CSF, that's, that's one, and secondly, there is no real commercial available assay to measure this. So although this has been measured repeatedly in different animal models, to date we don't have a commercially available one for human CSF. And so it's being looked at as a way of looking at, you know, because many of the other diseases that Trelos is being used for, uh, autophagy is an important part of the pathway. So we're gonna look at that, but right now we don't have an assay that would reliably give us the answer to that. So. We're looking more for the clinical biomarkers of survival, et cetera. Yeah, you know, in the platform trial, we do ask people if, if they're willing to um, provide uh, spinal fluid. And I'd say about 10 to 15% of people are doing that, which is fantastic. And we do collect urine and blood. And, and as these new biomarkers come available, you know, we, we have the ability to, to, to test them. So I know there's lots of people working on uh, really amazing biomarkers. So hopefully um, we'll have some good tools um, to analyze in the study. Yeah, question for, for Dr. Lada in terms of um, how many people are going to be enrolled in this regimen. Can you tell us how many participants we're looking for and how many participants per site? Yeah, and, and I have to admit, I'm not sure exactly the number that our statisticians have come up with. I think it's around 120 or 130 patients for the regimen. Is that correct? It's about 160. 160, 160. okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, th there is not a limit um, um, at any site. So um, I, I think in general, sites are, are taking as many people as they have the staff to handle. Um, so it may vary a little bit um, site to site, but there isn't kind of an official uh, number for each site. Well, and there's a couple of interesting questions about uh, hypermetabolism. So one question is, why does the body of an ALS patient use more calories than usual, even if the body doesn't move much? And then would triolos provide a burst of energy targeting hypermetabolism? So I would answer the second one first. I, I think the answer is no from that. Um, uh, ingesting triolos, or getting an infusion of trailers rather is similar to taking on a, a three or four cans of Coca-Cola. So I don't think that would give you a huge burst of energy, but uh, which is why we can't have diabetic patients. Um, in terms of the metabolism, I think at the end of the day, patients with ALS and other degenerative diseases are more catabolic. In other words, they're breaking down more than they're building up. And I'll, I'll, I'll let the Shifu and Merit 
comment on that as well. And I think that that's probably why it, that they are in a negative uh, state as opposed to being able to, you know, in a, in a meta, positive metabolic balance. So, uh, Mary. No, I think everything you said is correct. I, I honestly don't think we know why people with AOS are hypermetabolic. We, we do know that it happens even before people have their first uh, symptoms of weakness, that people have weight loss. Um, and it's also true in other neurodegenerative diseases like Huntington's disease. So I think it is something fundamental to the biology of the illness. But um, I don't know that anyone's really figured out yet why that's happening or, or uh, how to address it other than we know that not losing weight is good and, and eating lots of calories is good. Okay, one question about the drug. Would it raise blood sugar? Maybe Warren, do you want oh, to? There, yes, so we have looked at that carefully and um, it does cause a slight increase in your blood sugar for a brief period of time. Uh, it's very short-lived. It lasts only about an hour or two after the infusion. And in the patients who receive doses or uh, doses even higher than the dose that's been given in this particular study in our what's called single ascending dose study, the um, glucose level still remain within normal range. So it does go up, but it never goes up to like 140 or 150. And that study went from the mean of 91 in the patient's to a mean of 101, both of which in the normal range, basically. So there is a bump, but it's not substantial. And the second question around that is what happens to insulin? Well, there's a little bit of burst of insulin, but that only lasts for a brief period of time. And so everything, and again, this is a short, relatively short infusion and everything that's taking place in the metabolism, trailose is taking place fairly rapidly and things return to normal quickly. There's many questions, a few questions about the animal models. So um, going back to the animal models, are there slow progressors and fast progressors in the mouse models? And if so, was there any difference in the effectiveness of trialos in the two groups? Most of the work that's been done with trialos is the SOG1 mutation model. And as Merrick mentioned earlier, these are heavily loaded with genetic defects to, to produce the disease process. So I'm not sure that we can, if there really is a slow progressive low LR or a rapid progressor. Merit, maybe you have more insight into that. I don't, I don't think we know that. This, I think we're gonna learn those, um, we're gonna learn that from this study, but I think at least by, by the biology, it, it, again, this is something that we see in all people with ALS, this protein aggregation, um, independent really of speed. So I, I do think that um, I mean, I, I, that's most likely that this will, if it's effective, will be effective with everybody. Yeah, and again, on, on the mouse model, um, how come that the drug doesn't stop the disease? Is it because there is some tolerance that develops or some adaptation to the drug over time? Well, we don't believe that there's any tolerance related to the drug because it doesn't bind specifically to receptors that can cause down regulation receptors and things like that. However, um, so why it doesn't stop the progression, I think is we, we kind of answered that previously because there's a lot of other things that are going on. Um, and this is one of the aspects of the progression of the disease. Hopefully we can slow the progression by reducing the number of neurons that die uh, over time. So. And I, I just say that models are models. They're, they're not perfect. And um, the model uh, that's used most commonly is based on you know, the gene mutation, SOD1. And um, even the gene therapy to turn off that gene mutation didn't um, cure the mouse model because it, it's just made to be very aggressive. So you can get an answer in a couple months rather than studies that would take two or three years and, and uh, to screen a drug with a mouse model. So it's, it's not a great parallel, but it, it's really good for testing again if you're drug affects the biology you're targeting, um, which, which is, I think, what you showed here. Does trialos affect FDG PET imaging? Uh, we have not done any uh, PET imaging with uh, trialos as today. And in terms of mechanism, does it affect the transition of LPS to TDP43 or other aggregates? I'm sorry, say that again? Does trialos um, affect the transition um, to TDP43 or other aggregates? I think LLPS transition. I'm not sure I fully understand the question. So does it, does it prevent, prevent the aggregation of, of aggregates? If that's what you're asking, we, we're not sure. Um, what we, in the models? 
Yeah, in the models, all we can see is that we we had accumulation in anim certain animals and we had clearance in other animals. So, the specific question about possible interaction with uh, apple cider vinegar um, will drinking it affect the regimen? Uh, I, I, I think it should. Yeah. I don't can't think of any reason why that would do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And um, we have a question in general for, for Dr. Sukovic or Dr. Lada uh, in terms of uh, progression. So do you think that for a drug to be effective in treating people that have a, an average progression, let's say one point per month on the ALS and FRSR scale, would that drug have to reduce progression rate below one? Well, I mean, we often, that's one of our outcome measures, right? Is looking at the rate of ALS FRS progression. So, so to, if we use that as our outcome measure, then for it to be effective, yes, we would have to show that. If we were to use a different measure, I mean, you could, you could envision using survival as your measure. Um, how long does a participant survive? Um, and yes, that probably means slowing of the ALS FRS, but not necessarily. So, but I think the concept there is you do want to slow the disease down, right? And what measure you use may not be critical as long as you choose a measure that reflects um, a patient's um, longevity and survival. This was great. We, we, we have a few more questions coming in. Perhaps um, uh, I wanted to ask uh, 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 Warren if you have any last words from the point of view of the, of the drug, of Silos drug. No, I think the, uh, we're excited to be part of the trial. Um, we, we, we hope that uh, we can enroll quickly and uh, have a significant impact on uh, the patient's lives with ALS. And um, so we're more than uh, pleased to be a big a part of this program and, uh, and thank, I wanna thank Merritt and, and Sabrina and, and, and Shifu and everyone else who's been involved in helping us get this program together and up and running. Uh, for all their hard work and 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 from uh, from Silos, a very uh, heartfelt thanks. And I'll ask Shafu and Merit also if you have any uh, final words. Shafu, do, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah. No. I, the only final words is we're really excited to to get going. Um, we're excited to see how this first IV medication in the platform trial goes. So we know we're going to be learning along the way. Um, and, you know, feedback from our participants is really going to be important to how we conduct the rest of the trial and, and probably other IV um, medications in the platform trial in the future. I'll add my thanks to all of you who come uh, weekly and the new people and for being part of uh, the study, whether it was the past regimens or the new one, we can't uh, figure out ALS and get to those uh, cures without all of you. So uh, I really thank you. And I want to thank Warren and Luke and the entire CELOS team for working with us and for bringing in PCM in a way to be able to, to administer the drug in the home. I, I think that's going to be uh, transformational. So thank you for that. Great. Thank you to all the panelists, and we will be here again next week for our weekly updates. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.